I don't want to mispronounce your name, your but, last name. But this is Valentin. Uh, he's going to give a talk on how to save the world as a computer scientist. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Valentin Rochavi, or Shuravi, or Kuravi, or any other way of pronouncing it. Um, we have, as a family, given up to find a pronunciation that works for anybody. I want to talk today um, about how to save the world as a computer scientist, which is a slightly like sensationalist um, statement. But you know, um, I I am a PhD student here at MIT right now in CSER. Um, I work on the programming language Julia. And I didn't start out as a computer scientist. I started out originally um, studying in Germany, um, uh, researching cognitive science, and I was very much interested in how cognition comes about and what that, that can tell us about artificial intelligence. And at the end of my bachelor's studies, um, I decided that I wanted to take my co um, computational skills and apply them somewhere where I would enact positive change. So I, I uh, went uh, and did two, two and a half years of uh, research in um, biology, applying machine learning um, on, the, on studying the behavior of honeybees. That, was, um, that project ended up not going anywhere productively. Uh, it was a fun time. Um, and at the end of that, um, I moved to MIT, um, now doing programming languages. And really, this was me about, I think, 2016, um, uh, for a promotional shoot of the institute back then, uh, where I was working, uh, showing that computer science is uh, actually something that you can touch, because <laughs> they were like, we need to take a picture of you um, doing work. And I'm like, is that, that it was sitting at a laptop. And uh, they were like, no, that's not good uh, photography. What else do you do? And I'm like, well, I have honeybees on the roof that I work with and take videos of. And uh, if you work in the subtropics, honeybees are really relaxed and nice. Don't do this here. <laughs> I tried to do this last weekend, and I got stung really bad. <laughs> They're not relaxed. Um, and one of the uh, sentiments I wanted to echo from the previous speaker is, it can really be empowering helping people learn basic Unix. Um, in those two, two years, I spent a lot of time um, organizing what they called skill pills for Unix command line, Git, um, how to do basic programming to automate tasks in biology research, teaching people, hey, this is R, this is how you can get your research done. And like three or four years later now, I have um, friends from that time who like messaged me and are like, I have now taught other people how to do that. So um, it's really, take your time and teach people how to use computers effectively. So why, <laughs> why, why, why should, we want to, uh, should we want to save the world? Uh, in case you haven't heard, uh, climate change. Um, it's, it's really bad, um, and it's definitely human-made, despite other people saying otherwise. Um, I grew up in Germany. For me, it wasn't a question of belief. Um, you know, This is the prediction for what will happen to Boston in 20, 30 years if current predictions keep on holding, worst case, best case scenarios. But, uh, we, yeah, the, the issue is MIT is not a water, is already a waterfront property. <laughs> yes. So um, yeah, this is MIT, uh, and we are close enough that if rise, rising water happens and we don't invest massive amounts of money, this campus will be submerged at some point. We're just going to build a seawall. Right. That is. I'm I, 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 I'm fully aware that we as a community will overcome this challenge and build a gigantic seawall. Except they build seaport at sea level. Except, yes. I just I just also want you to think about for all the communities that can't do that. Also, correction. It will once again be underwater. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Also, we are building on landfill, so you. That's the old Boston. <laughs> So how can we help? Um, one of the, I think, articles that had actually a quite an uh, impact on my life, and it used to be like a short blog post, and now it's like a multi-page um, um, article, is uh, worrydream.com slash climate change. And if you have like a Sunday afternoon and, you don't, and you're searching for meaning in life, uh, take a look. It's about how technologists 
not just computer scientists, but technologists can help um, with, with the challenge of climate change and other problems. So as an example, what are those topics that we could maybe um, help with, with the knowledge and know-how we have gained at institutions like MIT? Well, one of the first things is power. Power, energy, energy consumption, energy generation. So in the topics of gen generation, there has been work at MIT um, where it's about can we build better models to estimate wind capacity at locations? That informs policy changes. That makes um, wind turbines more effective. Um, and by having more effective wind turbines, we need less coal power, therefore climate change. Um, same thing, better algorithms for turbine design, better programs for turbine designs. What can we do to make uh, these, uh, this work easier and more effective? And the other big problem is distribution, right? We can produce as much power as we want in the Baltic Sea or in the North Sea uh, with wind turbines, but if we don't get the power to where it matters or where people are living and using it, that doesn't help us. Um, forecasting of consumption production is an easy one that comes to mind there. Um, we, computer scientists, are great at building models, building better models that forecast production and consumption would be really helpful. Um, this all falls into the topic of smart grid. Um, how, can, how can we build a decentralized system that uh, consumes and produces energy effectively? Yeah. Right, so um, I mean, the question is then uh, long distance transport um, of power. And uh, the best way of doing that is high voltage D uh, DC. Um, Right. The, the question is, how do we do power more effectively, and how do we get from our age and infrastructure to a more modern one is very much a uh, very interesting topic. And it's surprisingly complicated. Like, you can't just go and say the solution to our problem to climate change is turning off all coal um, uh, turbines. Because we are relying on AC, and AC needs to stay within a, fr a stable frequency envelope. And that stable frequency envelope is provided by the spinning mass of heavy metal turbines in water and coal. Uh, uh, yes. That shut it down. Right. And so if, if you start shutting down these heavy, big, centralized energy producers, you suddenly get the entire grid into a regime where it's instable um, and you can have blackouts. Uh, there was a recent one across all of southern Europe. Um, where one of the countries didn't keep up their frequency uh, control and that led to a cascading failure up to, I think, southern Germany. And then you can't restart it because you can't electricity to restart it. Exactly. Other issues are usage, right? How are we using power efficiently? Are we using power efficiently? Can we make smarter um, energy consumption? Uh, better decisions about house, cooling, temperature, um, there is, if, you, if you're still on CSEL Related, uh, there was a fantastic, one of the few highlights of CSEL Related, there was an actually good uh, article about why is Status so cold. Right, Status is CSEL um, building and uh, it is notoriously cold in the summer and hot in the winter and there seems no balance. So yeah. Right, so one of, one, of the, one of the points there is um, we need to be better at designing buildings and rooms so that actually cooling and temperature control can be efficient and not use as much power as it currently is. The other point that was just raised is some of these issues are social and some of them can't be solved with technology. Also keep that in mind. One of the other issues um, that we could uh, maybe consider uh, looking into is transportation. And the obvious one that comes up is autonomous vehicles, because if you have self-driving cars, maybe that's a way for more efficient um, mass transit. Generally speaking, um, one big way of helping would be inventing video conferencing that doesn't suck. <laughs> like, seriously, people, why am I getting on a plane to fly over uh, to California to give a talk? Um, instead of being there uh, speaking remotely. <laughs> yes, right, the, the whole purpose of, flow, of uh, going over there is uh, social engagement, being able to talk with people, side conversations, but still. Hmm? Yes. 
the other issue is like just collaboration tools that suck less. I mean, um, it's still astounding to me that like spending a week in a place is more efficient than actually like, collaborating with somebody online. Uh, but okay. And um, outside of those like big, big topics that you can tackle, um, one of them that is actually computer science research is better tools for scientists and engineers. Uh, there are people outside computer science in these buildings that are tackling all of these questions. And we shouldn't presume that we know better. Um, but the question is, what can we actually do to make their lives easier? Um, on, on that website, there's a fantastic quote about programming languages, um, which is basically saying, well, R and MATLAB are bad. You should. The fact that we're forcing our engineers and our scientists to use them should make us ashamed as programming language researchers. Yes, <laughs> it, is, it is the most effective bodge. Um, R, is fan, R is fantastic for what it does, but it's also terrifying. Um, and it's a funny topic, like I, I'm now in a programming language uh, researchers community, and the, the, this is a quote from the website I mentioned earlier, and it's like most of the work programming language research does is either about programming language research, like Occaml and Haskell are fantastic programming languages, if the only problem that you have ever considered is building a compiler and doing programming language research. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. It's, it's on tape. Um, and then, of course, we are heavily concerned about how do we get uh, novice programmers into computer science or in, into programming more effectively, but it's mostly focusing on how do we produce more software developers? How do we build tools for software developers? Well, but of course, e even if you produce better tools, let's assume you could produce really better tools. Yes. The problem you also face is convincing everyone who is trained. You have to start early because everyone who's already trained is going to say, I already know how to use that tool. Why do I want to learn a new one? Yes. And that's why they're all still programming in Fortran. Yes. That's <laughs> <laughs> Uh, boy, so, yes. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, there, there were two very important comments. One of them is maybe more domain specific tools that are not actually programs, but um, modeling frameworks for expressing problems. Um, and the other one is how do you overcome the impetus um, of actually having everybody change? And that's a very big what challenge. <laughs> Um, so, one, to, to the point that was just raised, one of the ways of dealing with this is actually building more programming language for modeling physical systems. Um, and this is indeed, right, right now, this is how most climate um, simulations are written. They're written in something that looks and smells and is Fortran. <laughs> and it, and to this day, you, you're having like people coming into oceanographic or climate research, and they and they have I have to ask the question: How do I change the model? And the answer is there is a graybeard in the room, in the building uh, somewhere. We don't know quite where, but go talk to him. He will tell you where. I we we made progress, right? It's uh, also Fortran as a language. I don't. I hate it as much as I do other languages. It's, it's good at what it does. Um, I just don't think we should keep it as a status quo. Um, another, um, this is Modelica. Modelica is actually a programming language environment um, that is set to describe and model physical systems like your AC um, and the effect your AC has on your room. And once you describe your room, and your um, air conditioning, then you can take it and say, okay, I want to build an air conditioning system that actually works for the entire building. But it does have spell What? It doesn't have spell check. Apparently it doesn't have spell check, I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, one of the like, fundamental uh, statements uh, coming from cognitive science is the limits of my language are, my, are the limits of my world, which is what something Wittgenstein, a German philosopher, said. Um, and it really describes if, if I can't express my statements, how do I even talk to you? How do I communicate with you? Um, if we do not use a shared language, how do we 
achieve anything as a community. And in many ways, math has been that common language for science. So now to real actionable change or real projects uh, I'm involved with. Um, right now there is the Climate Project, which is a new climate model being written at MIT Caltech and uh, the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, which aims to reduce uncertainties and biases in prediction. And it's an accelerated timetable. Basically, uh, the collaboration of, of uh, scientists went to a couple of founders and were like, we would like to have funding to get money for this project. And they were like, that sounds like a great idea. How much time do we have to use this information? And they were like, well, if we don't know the answers to some of these questions in three years, we cannot make effective policy that will enact actual change. Um, the team consists of computer scientists, climate scientists, mathematicians, all of them in some way need to speak the same language, write something that works across multiple hardware platforms, is performance portable, and is also readable, maintainable, by all of the members of the collaboration and not just by the computer scientists. And there are people in the, uh, in, the, in the collaboration who've written Fortran code for their entire lives and were very happy with that. But then there are also young graduate students who just started climate science and are like, you, you want me to learn Fortran 70? <laughs> <laughs> if, if we would use Fortran 99, I would be happy. <laughs> One of the goals of Climber is to actually learn from embedded models, to have high resolution models, embed them into our global models, and use them to improve predictions that the global model is making over long uh, periods of times. If you want to learn more about that, uh, klima.caltech.edu is um, the project web page, um, and there were some articles recently, one in Technology Review and the other one about more the computational side um, on the NVIDIA blog. The um, model, one of the embedded models um, that we are writing is Oceanenigans, um, which I have to admit the name is, is, is my fault because I can't speak English properly, as you have noticed with my accent. Um, uh, my collaborators walked into my room and I asked them, what are we going to do today? To do today? I'm up for all shenanigans. <laughs> <laughs> And they were like, ocean and again, and, and therefore the, the name changed immediately. Um, it's a non-hydrostatic ocean model um, implemented all in Julia um, and running across G CPUs and GPUs. It's, if you're doing um, uh, computational fluid dynamics, finite volume incompressible in Nambia Stokes over says something to you, otherwise it simulates water. <laughs> <laughs> it's written... Yeah. <laughs> it's written in 100% uh, in Julia. Um, it, the, we are highly performant. We are matching the performance of the original MIT GCM ocean parts. Um, we think it's readable. Uh, we think it's relatively concise code. It runs on CPUs and GPUs uh, on a shared code base. Uh, you can, there's a fun uh, uh, online um, tutorial where you take in data from the model and then actually do uh, simulations and visualizations. It's developed here at EPS um, by my collaborators, Ali Ramadan and Craig Wagner. And the thing I did for this project was, from a computer science uh, perspective, very simple. I wrote a tiny macro-based kernel language for code that runs on CPUs and GPUs. It really isn't more than that is you specify a, a loop, and then um, on the left-hand side you say, this is how the loop is executed on a CPU, and on the right-hand side here you say, um, this is how the loop is executed on the GPU. The goal is to enable really effective, um, fast GPU code, so there's some more construct in this language um, that are GPU-specific, um, and then lower to slightly inefficient representation on the CPU. Um, and it's macro-based, it's, I think I wrote it in two days, um, and for the uh, EAPS folks, it has been a game changer just because they didn't need to have two copies of the same code, one for GPUs, one for CPUs. They could actually write bigger models. Um, it's also used in the main climate simulations for the global model, etc. And I was surprised. I thought, 
I thought I would like meet up with them, we sit down, I, I get a research project, I would go away for two years, I would come back and be like, here's a solution for your, for your problems. And they were like, we just want to be able to do this. And I was, okay, yeah, I can, I can, I can hack this. Um, I, I'm, I have no idea how to publish this. <laughs> but it's really effective, it works, it gets the job done, um, and now I can go off and do actual research on how to do this properly. Um, So one of the solutions is actually to do cool CS research, right? There is, there is this allure of saying, I'm a computer scientist and I want to solve climate change, so I now have to study uh, climate science. And then you're starting on a four-year back foot to all the people who have been studying climate science for four years because they had the realization a lot earlier. Uh, computer science, yes. Computer, com sorry, yes. Um, so one of the avenues to look into is scientific machine learning. So how do we actually apply all the machine learning models that we have recently, like building up as a community and then use to uh, classify cat pictures to do actual science? Um, so that would involve research in automatic differentiation. How do I optimize programs better? Um, you can also do compiler research. Like, I'll, we know that there, like, time to solution is an important metric. If I have a question in science and I can't get an answer within a certain time period, it might not matter anymore. So how can we build faster, higher level languages? I think it's a matter of fact that outside um, the core HPC uh, uh, community, people like higher level language because it lets them express problems in a nicer fashion. How do we do performance portability? I, I don't want to rewrite code anymore. Like I've written code. And now I want to run that code on different hardware, on architecture. It shouldn't be architecture specific. So how do we do with heterogeneous computing? How do we do better algorithms? We're really good at algorithms. Um, there's hardware research. Anything you can come up with, consider what it can do for people outside your field. Don't engage in the necessary like computer science or like tech industry handshake of um, finding a, a a solution, uh, finding a solution and then searching for the problem. <laughs> Sometimes. So, one of the questions earlier is, even if we had now finally the perfect high-level language, and I alluded to, I worked on Julia, um, that might be my consideration of the perfect high-level language, um, how, why yet another one? Right? What we want really is something that is dynamically typed, high-level syntax, doesn't get in the way of do getting the job done. We would love it to be open source permissive license, has a built-in package manager, which is the, you have to be this high to uh, enter a conversation um, metric for programming languages these days. Um, and it should uh, em enable and empower interactive development. So this is Julia, if you have never seen it. It looks like um, the grandchild of Fortran, inspired by Python and R. It takes all of the good ideas and uh, hopefully kept out the bad ones. Um, we have some odd ideas as well. It's not that, it's, um, it's, yeah. I'm running out of time, so that's why I'm hurrying a little bit. All right, but then I'm keeping people from lunch. That is cool and unusual. Okay, so well then, <laughs> I keep you entertained while we wait for our food. <laughs> so, some of the unusual features of Julia is that it actually has great performance. And if you've ever done anything about programming languages and ever wondered why Python is so slow, that should surprise you. Um, it uses a just-in-time and ahead of time just in time ahead of time compilation, which means there is a latency. But the first time you execute a function, it compiles it. And sometimes when you run in a big model, it can take forever. Um, forever is a variable time frame depending on the patience of the person in front of the computer. Sometimes it's milliseconds, other times it's minutes. Um, in the worst time I messed up and I introduced quadratic behavior in an exponential uh, path of the compiler and we looked at 18 hours. <laughs> so it's not using LLVM. It is using LLVM. Okay. Yeah. Mm, yes and no. Um, so the one question was, is it using LVM? And yes, indeed it is. And the other one is, couldn't we use some ideas from V8 to make that faster? And the answer is yes, but we ain't Google. So we do not have 
30 engineers to throw as a problem. Um, so we had to actually do clever language design uh, instead of just throwing resources. It has powerful reflection and metaprogramming which make extensions like what I showed you earlier um, very easy to write. In some sentence, uh, in some form, um, if you ever wondered what happened to the MLIS project, so uh, the, the planned successor of Lisp that had, uh, were supposed to have C-like or Fortran-like uh, syntax, um, in many cases it looks like Julia. It would, would have looked like Julia. It's, it is a Lisp uh, underneath. It uses multiple dispatch and like, has fun um, ideas um, about, about how, how programming languages should work. So for me, why Julia? It's hackable, it's extendable. I can look at every step of the compiler. I can uh, interact with it. I can actually do research based on it. But it's not a programming language research language, right? Or Kamel, Haskell are very much languages made for programming languages research. And therefore, many of the solutions coming there don't have an impact on the real world. It's built upon LLVM which is important to be able to target a lot of the modern hardware and get good performance without having a gigantic team. Um, in some ways, if you ever wanted to like, get code into LLVM quickly and don't want to hack on Clang, it's my favorite LLVM front end, um, it has a lot of users, especially in scientific computing, especially in the field of people who want to enact change and do uh, research um, on climate change, on policies, on uh, global issues. Um, it is open development, MIT licensed, and my personal goal, and that's why I'm standing here, is I want to enable scientists and engineers to collaborate with computer science and HPC experts. And basically, the, uh, I want to be able to travel back in time and give myself all the tools I've built over the last um, eight years um, and enable my original research that I wanted to do. Yeah. So one of the particularly nice things right now about Python <coughs> is that it works in the Apache Spark environment and it works on Dask, which means that you can run a single MapReduce on yes. thousands of machines. Yes. Does Julia have support for Yarn or Spark or something like that? Uh, there are some packages and research development or work in that direction. It's always a matter of research. My, my jobs need thousands of cores, yeah. not, not a few GPUs. No, I, I, I run on thousands of CPUs and uh, tens of thousands of GPUs. So that's my job. But um, there is YARN integration. I haven't checked it how good it is because my jobs are not MapReduce. Um, and there is... Uh, a task similar project called so Dagger. If you run thousands of machines, how do you orchestrate that using the Julia language? Right. I, um, I, ha I still have to use MPI. I'm so sorry. I know. Isn't it sad? <laughs> I'm actively working on overcoming that challenge, but yes. Uh, talk to me after I'm done with my PhD. <laughs> 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 that is actually my research topic, is how to not have to use MPI. Can you call Python from Julia? Yes, very easily and the other way around. So interesting projects to look out. One of them is Modia. Modia is a redevelopment of Modelica, uh, which is basically taking the idea of um, simulating physical systems and providing domain-specific extension and languages for that. Um, if you're doing physics, differential equations, modeling, Tukel.gl have some very interesting ideas um, developed here at MIT by Chris Rakaus, who is an instructor in mathematics. Um, if you're doing pharmacometrics, medic, uh, medic, medicine modeling, there's a big project right now um, to aim at that. There are a lot of different ideas around probabilistic programming, which surprised me. Like, I didn't expect that to, uh, two years ago to see these developments happening. So there's Gen, which is developed here at MIT, um, Turing, which is, I think, a collaboration between Cambridge and Oxford, and then SOS, which is uh, coming out of somebody in Seattle. Um, if you're into machine learning, we have um, PyTorch-esque, 100% um, written in Julia, and Flux is actually quite interesting because it, you look at it, and instead of having a 100,000 line big machine learning toolkit where you can't do any changes, or doing any changes takes three months, writing C++ code, I've been there, I've done that, um, it's, the core of it is like 700, 800 lines of code. It's very small, uses extensible components, and is not 
locking you in. You mentioned there are worse things in Yes. Um, if you want to hear more about Julia and you're still around tomorrow, I'm actually uh, giving a talk about making dynamic programs run fast, um, which is going to more, a lot more about the technical details of how, how Julia actually works underneath the hood. Um, we have a yearly Delta meeting. Um, uh, last year we were in Baltimore, next year we will be somewhere in Europe, um, where a lot of talks come. And it's not a computer, it's not a conference for the programming language, it's for the users of the programming language. So we get talks about scientific projects, we get talks about uh, how to effectively um, do change in, in companies using Julia, how um, the Fed is using Julia to model economy and stuff like that. And um, all of those talks are online. Um, we live stream and record them. And now the uh, mandatory thanks. Um, I have a lot of collaborators, and without them, it wouldn't be possible to do any of the work I do. Um, so thank you for listening to me, and uh, I'm going to be around if you have any questions. <laughs>